Hi again, and welcome back to part 4 in this series about ray tracing. In this part, I'll take these equations, which were developed in the previous video, and I'll apply them to the atmosphere. To do that, I'll need a model for the speed of light in the atmosphere. And I know that the speed of light in the atmosphere is the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the refractive index. And the refractive index can be found by using a model known as CIDDOR, or C-I-D-D-O-R. And this model describes the refractive index given a temperature and a pressure. To describe the temperature and pressure of the atmosphere, that of course depends on the weather, the time of day, and so on, but I can use uh, an approximation which is the International Standard Atmosphere. This model describes the temperature and pressure up to about 86,000 meters. Let's look at the code that implements these models. Here I have a function called refract. It takes in the height above the surface and it returns the speed of light and the gradient of the speed of light. The function uses the speed of light in the vacuum. It uses the function atmos, which calculates temperature and pressure according to the international standard atmosphere. And it uses the function CIDOR, which calculates the refractive index. While calculating pressure, temperature and refractive index at two different elevations, we can find the speed of light and its gradient. The atmos function itself takes in the height above the surface and returns temperature and pressure. The SIDOR function takes in wavelength in microns, CO2 concentration, temperature, pressure, and humidity. In this example, I'm only modeling temperature and pressure. While CO2 and humidity do have some effect, this effect is small. Now, let's look at what these models output. The first two plots show how temperature and pressure change with elevation. And these are the outputs of the Atmos function. We see that temperature starts at 15 degrees, decreases through the troposphere, increases through the stratosphere, and then finally decreases through the mesosphere till it reaches a steady temperature. The pressure starts at about 100 kilopascals and decreases smoothly towards zero pressure in a close to exponential way. The third plot shows how the refractive index changes. This is calculated based on the temperature and pressure in the two leftmost plots. The unit is refractivity, and that indicates how many parts per million larger than one the refractive index is. We see that with increasing elevation, the refractivity goes towards zero, and this means that refractive index goes towards one, which is what we expect as we approach a near vacuum of space. Now that we have an idea of how these models work and look, let's look at the, how the ray tracing itself is done. The first step is initialization. The position of the light ray is initialized to x equals 0, y equals 0, and z equals 2. This represents a point that's 2 meters above the surface. When initializing the slowness of the light, which is what describes the direction that it propagates, we remember that we must use the inverse of the speed of light. I'm initializing the light ray to move only in the x-axis direction. It has no speed in the z or y-axis. Looking a bit further, I use the function ODE45 to do the heavy lifting. This is a differential equation system solver that's included in both MATLAB and Octave. And I'm using Octave in this case. The function ODE45 takes in a description of the differential equations that are to be solved, called f, it takes in a range of values for s for which to solve these differential equations, which is the range of distances. And it also takes in the initial values of the differential equations, as well as some parameters that are used to control the accuracy of the simulation. The purpose of the function f is that it relates the derivative of the state variable y and the variable y itself, just like the mathematical expression that we are modeling does. I have implemented two variants of this function. We can choose to either simulate with a flat, simplified Earth or a round Earth. In the flat Earth case, elevation is simply the z component of our position, which is the third element of our state variable. The zenith vector on the flat Earth always points up in the z direction. If we use the round Earth model instead, the elevation must be computed by finding the distance from the center of the Earth and subtracting the Earth's radius. The zenith vector here is simply the normalized distance from the center of the Earth. 
Now that we have an elevation and a zenith vector, we can find the light speed and its gradient that's appropriate to use in the equations that we're solving. I've also added another function which allows the ray tracing to be stopped in case the ray hits the ground. The rest of the code is used to format and present a nice plot. And finally, I'm calculating the curvature of the ray trajectories that we had just ray traced. I'm comparing the Earth's radius to that curvature, both at the start of the ray and at the end of the ray. That gives us the parameters k1 and k2. I also calculate the angle difference between the starting and ending direction of the ray, which I'm going to call the deflection of the ray. Let's look at the results from one simulation. Here we have a ray traced, showing the ray in yellow. And the horizontal axis is the x-axis, while the vertical axis is the z-axis. The green line represents the surface of a simplified flat Earth. The ray of light in yellow starts at 2 meters elevation and it propagates towards the right until it hits the ground. Looking at the curvature that we've calculated, the radius of a round Earth is about 17% of the radius of this ray. And this means that the ray curves less than the Earth. The deflection of the ray is about 0.02 degrees. The plot here shows an exaggerated amount of bending since the horizontal axis represents a distance that's about 10,000 times bigger than the vertical axis. Let's now change our simulation to a round Earth and we change the distance that we're simulating from 20 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers. Remember now that our horizontal axis is even larger than before. Now, with this result, we see that the ray is not curving as much as the Earth's surface. And from the calculated curvature, we see about the same uh, curvature at the start of the ray as before. The Earth's radius starts at about 17% of the Earth's radius. However, at the end of the ray, the ray radius is much larger than the Earth's radius, meaning that the ray flattens out. This is because the ray reaches higher elevations above the Earth, where the gradient of the light speed is very small. The atmosphere gets thinner and eventually it has no effect and it will not bend the light ray. The deflection angle is 0.55 degrees, which is approximately the angular size of the sun. And this means that when we look at something beyond the Earth's atmosphere, like the sun, it will appear higher up in the sky by 0.55 degrees. This means that if the sun was just below the physical or geometric horizon, this deflection of the light by 0.55 degrees would still give us a line of sight to the sun, making it visible just above the horizon, even though it's physically just below the horizon. For my last example, I've created a special case here. I've added a temperature inversion layer that exists in the lowest 5 meters of the atmosphere. And here, the temperature increases by 0.13 degrees Celsius per meter. Let's look at the result that this gives. What we see here is that the ray of light follows the surface of the Earth very closely. If we zoom in at the start, we see that it curves at the same rate as the Earth. And if we zoom in at the end, we see the same thing. Looking at the curvature calculated for this, the Earth's radius is very close to 100% of the ray's radius. They are essentially the same radius. And this matches, of course, what we just saw in the graphs. As a summary, we have managed to implement this ray tracer. And we made the observation that light curves slightly down in the standard atmosphere allows us to see further over and behind obstacles that we would expect to block our view if light traveled straight. This is an effect known as looming. By making the temperature gradient positive around 0.13 degrees Celsius per meter, the radius of the ray becomes the same as the radius of the Earth, allowing you to see extremely far as long as the temperature gradient is favorable. There can of course be things like haze or dust or other effects that limit the effective visibility by absorbing or scattering light, but this effect is not simulated here. That's what I wanted to show for this series. One possible way to extend this is to send out a lot of rays, simulate where the rays are hitting, and you can build up an image based on that information. You can also take the ray tracing and examine how the light propagates through various lenses of a camera or a telescope to understand how it works and how it creates an image, or 
you can examine how radio waves propagate through the atmosphere. In that case, you would need a refractive index model that's accurate for radio wavelengths. So I hope I gave you some ideas here and that you learned something. I'll link to the free software that I used, Octave. And I'll also link to the code that I used in the description. Thanks for following the series. Please like and subscribe if you found it useful. And I'll see you next time.